We want to welcome Mike Lee to Jazz Biz 101. Thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for inviting me into your lovely home. Yeah. Yes. Oh, if he, yes. If you guys didn't know, this is uh, our in, home. In, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me into your glorious studio. Your uh, yeah, ep yeah. epic uh, multi-tiered uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there's separate rooms. Sound stage. Right, yes. right. There's like three recording sessions yes. going on right now. Right, right. <laughs> Only three? Yeah, it's a slow morning. Mike Lee is a fantastic uh, saxophonist, well known as an educator around here. He's also known as being one of the best jazz parents around, <laughs> <laughs> as he'll tell you himself. Maybe you could tell us some of the other things that uh, you feel like you want to let the audience know oh, about. Uh, well, I've had the good fortune of playing with, well, tomorrow night playing with Josh Evans' big band. That's always one of my favorite uh, events. Oliver Lake big band. I tour quite a lot with Lost and Harris Trio. And we just didn't get back from Shanghai, which we didn't go to. We were supposed to spend three weeks in Shanghai. But we play at the Carlisle about five months a year. Three to f I, I join him three to five nights a week. He does five nights a week there. Been doing a lot of gigs lately with Nat Adderley Jr., which has been fun. We've been traveling and playing at Mittens and, and doing some... And he's nice local game. too, right? He is. He's, in, you know, he's part of, well, a lot of, New Jersey. Lo lot of, <laughs> lot of musicians in New Jersey. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then also, uh, you've been recording quite a bit as a leader yourself, have quite a number of experience of years uh, doing that. Uh, and recently, uh, I guess Lenny White has his own uh, recording label that right. you've been um, been a part of that. Right. We Where's released that? Song for All of Us about a year ago on his, his label. It features Lenny White and uh, um, Bruce Williams, Ed Howard, Dave Stryker, a couple of my kids. <laughs> Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> George Colligan <laughs> plays piano. It's a, it's a yeah, that's a yeah. project I'm pretty proud of. That's a nice one. Yeah, no, yeah, that sounds great. Love the whole record. Oh, yeah, thank you. I loved it, man. First thing we want to start off with uh, is just talk about. Um, well, you're from Cleveland, Ohio, so maybe you could just talk a little bit about your time in Cleveland and just like um, were you part of the scene at that point or what? What was yeah. it like growing up there? Well, yeah, I, I grew up there. I, I started to play um, jazz music in uh, various venues in Cleveland. I moved away to go to, to Cincinnati. Went, just went to school for a couple years and moved back to Cleveland, and that's when I kind of started to work as a young man. And shortly after I did that, I decided I wanted to be in New York. So I moved to New York. I spent four years in New York, and that was kind of my... I had some nice things there, um, but it was, it was really a, a learning time i i took some classes at nyu but i didn't really that wasn't the focus of my mm. my time so in my mid-20s i moved back to cleveland that's you know where i really was part of the scene and established i mean actually before i moved to new york i, I had the good fortune of working a lot i think one of the things that motivated motivated me to move to new york is that i was getting a lot of gigs and i was kind of the man on the you know i was doing all kinds of stuff and it was like i don't really play well enough to be having all this going on so mm. I wanted to, to go to, to New York because I heard that it would challenge me. And, and as, as Bill, it kicked my ass pretty hard. <laughs> and so that, yeah. that four years, I mean, it was great. It was a great learning experience. Mm -hmm. And I did get to play with some great people and meet, mm -hmm. meet some great musicians. But upon moving, then, I, then after about four years of that, I was like, the hustle in New York is so intense. I wanted to be back in Cleveland where I knew I could work and practice. Gotcha. That was really my incubation period too do many hours a day of oh, practice and gotcha. so that's that was about five years and I met Rebecca my lovely wife um during that time and mm -hmm. I mean yeah I met her pretty pretty soon after moving back and okay and so what was going to be just a, a year-long hiatus to to shed and get my stuff together and come back to New York um turned into to five years because she was finishing uh first a degree and then a, a diploma program at, at a Cleveland Institute of Music, and gotcha. so after that, we uh, we made this the trip to Brooklyn and and yeah started tr trying to really you know that's when I really started to work and play with the Village Vanguard Orchestra and Maria Schneider's big band and people like Elliot Zygman and Dave Douglas and I had a few gigs together and so it's some things like that mm -hmm. um, to to kind of get it established. So that was in like the nineties. In nineties, okay. Yeah. And gotcha. then and then after my son Julian was born. A couple of years after that, we decided we wanted some uh, bigger space for him to run around in and get a house. So we 
that's when we came out to Jersey. Gotcha. Yeah. Always looking for that bigger house yeah. in New Jersey. It's the place to be. I think a lot of people that move over here, it's like the conviction to move here is obviously it takes a lot to move away from where you're familiar right. and to be in uh, the place you want to be and be surrounded by all these great musicians. What's kind of like your uh, advice about people that are moving some from like from different places that want to be in New York? Like what do they need? to do to be ready for that? Or is it kind of just, uh, should you just go off their impulse and just like, oh, let's do it? Like, what's your... Well, no, I think I think, I think it's good to get a, a read on what to, how to prepare to come to New York. I mean, first of all, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that don't live in New York that I think try to argue against the notion that New York is a, a more challenging place or that the best musicians are here or this and that. And, and to be sure, there are great musicians in other places. There's some really wonderful music happening. But in my extensive travels around the United States and, and the world, there is no scene that, that you can even compare it to because the level of players also, as you were just talking about, the conviction to move to New York. Like when you find out the musicians that live here, it's the people that uprooted themselves, left their home, and came here out of an aspiration to become excellent musicians, to be, you know, to be among the greatest musicians in the world. And that in itself is a drive and a, and a particular purpose that is unique to New York. Then there's just the numbers. Like half of the great musicians that came up in Cleveland stayed in Cleveland, and half of them moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And then as I started realizing, well, half of the great players in Chicago stayed in Chicago, and half of them moved to New York. And then half of the great players in Tokyo stayed in Tokyo, and half of them moved to New York, and right. half of the great yeah. players in Paris. And, right. you know, so it seems to me like every, every scene has half of their scene come here. I don't think what I was prepared for when I first came here was going to sit in back then there was a place called the star cafe it's actually oh, where yes. i met i met our friend steve teray for the first time back back then and and kenny garrett was just a kid hanging out there and sitting in and, and getting it you know getting up and sitting in on a tune you know and having some guy bump in looking and get mad and realize it's woody shaw and going like oh okay <laughs> and then and, you know getting up and junior cooks playing you know you just it's like your heroes are are there sitting in and playing and hanging out and then there's 14, I remember counting one time, there was 14 tenor players in line to solo on one tune. Just tenor players. There were alto players, trumpet players, and trombone players, but 14 tenor players. So just the sheer number. And I think the other shock that I got it was, you know, in, in Cleveland, I was kind of a hometown hero. I would, you know, when mm -hmm. I came, they'd brush me right up on the stage and like, you know, more how I'm treated now in New Jersey. You know, it's like, it took, <laughs> it took 40 years, but it, it, it happened here, but... You know, back then I was 20 years old and everyone wanted me to sit in and be on their gigs and, mm. and what's happening. But just to come here and, and had, get that absolute silence after a solo <laughs> was shocking. I was, like the people, I was like the people running up and trying to get my card and, and you know, applauding and stuff. And just there, I was like, yeah, so anyway, what's going on? You know, I think a lot of people leave because of that. They come here with the notion that I'm one of the best and they get here and it's like, you're just... Wake up call. You know, the, yeah, the... The universe is now telling them you're just like <laughs> one of the many things to know about moving to New York. I guess if, if you're a, a young person, maybe at school in the Midwest or, or, or another country or something, and you want to come here, um, you know, musicians are expected to know a lot of tunes. I think when I, when I travel, I'm always surprised at how many people are looking at books and, and doing things that we try not to do here, looking at phones now, right, right. Um, you know, just knowing a lot of repertoire, being able to play in different keys. You know, and being able to work with singers, you know, I think I think we really lose something as jazz musicians when we we distance ourselves from the vocal tradition, from the idea of singing, which is what right. most of the world is going to relate to. As we discussed before, we know that Mike Lee is a fantastic musician, but on top of that, he is a really good parent, and um, I think a lot of <laughs> I know some people that might disagree with that today. <laughs> I, yeah, well, you know, a lot of uh, people here, in, especially in New Jersey, uh, really appreciate Mike's role as a parent, and um, he's raised some really great kids, uh, three kids all together. Um, so I'm going to let him talk a little bit. Well, let me let me talk first about about how I became a a jazz dad. As I mentioned, we we had moved out to New Jersey when when uh, my oldest son Julian was very young. And you know, I was trying to figure out ways that I could make money not going on the road. I had, had some success touring un, under my own name as a as a clinician and soloist. You know, going playing with local rhythm sections and um, playing doing a lot of clinics at colleges. Feel like one of the most fortunate saxophone teachers in the world right now that I 
get to teach so many motivated, uh, strong, young saxophonists. But back then, I was just teaching regular kids. That, you know, I was going to their houses and, and you know doing it the way most musicians have to start. I was fairly frustrated. I wasn't. I wasn't happy about the type of gigs. Some of these gigs that we just talked about weren't happening yet, and some had happened in the past. But I was in a, you know, place where I wasn't working very much as a jazz musician and I was trying to stay home and, and teaching was a necessity and I'm not going to say it was a lovely period in terms of being in a great community and having a beautiful home and amazing wife one and then two wonderful little boys but it was it was a, it was a it was a tough period in my career I'd say it was a, it was a dark period you know it wasn't wasn't going well and I love music I love my kid, so I was like, and I had this saxophone with bent down keys, and he said he wanted to try it. So when Julian was seven, I said, uh, well, let's start doing this. And at the time, he had been playing piano and cello. He started on violin. My wife's a violinist. Yeah, you too? Yeah. <laughs> now, it's a great instrument to start because you can start so young. Um, all three of my children started on violin. At the time he was seven, he had switched over to cello, and he had started piano lessons. He was doing very well at both of them, and he said he wanted to try saxophone. He picked up the saxophone, and in the first lesson, we had him playing a low B-flat up to a high F. Because I was dealing with a lot of high school students that were not particularly distinctive as, as saxophonists. And all of a sudden, I had this little kid that could do things on the first day. It was pretty inspiring. It was pretty wonderful. And, you know, within three weeks, he could play all his major scales, full range of the saxophone. You know, he was seven years old. And at the time, I didn't understand that seven is really too young to start saxophone. I, no one told me that. And I only had one seven-year-old, and he was not too young to start. And by the time he was 11, I was like, he's going to be a play, you know, like the kind of things he's doing now. I could see at that time he was going to be touring with Wynton Marcellus' quintet and, and playing in the Lincoln Center Band and, you know, touring all over the world with a band like The Shakes, like he does, you know, having his own gigs at Lincoln Center and play at Smalls all the time and play, you know. I knew this was going to be his future, you know, I could just see it. It was amazingly inspiring because I think I was ready to go down the route of so many people that you and I both know that are like, oh, it's, you know, the business sucks and it's not about how well you play and it's, you know, I can't get a gig because I'm fill in the blank, you know. I can't get the gig because I'm a man, you know, and they're, they're all these female bands go, I can't get a gig because I'm white or I can't get a gig because I'm black and I, you know, you, you, know the, you know the route. We've all seen, it. you know, people, and I think I was well on my way to becoming a um, disgruntled former, you know, player. And having this this happen was really inspiring. You know, I just asked, I remember, I don't know if I actually looked in the mirror and said it, but I, I asked myself the question, is like, do you really want to tell this story to your kid? And it, it allowed me to get on my career path in, in a much more inspired way. Their influence on me was as big as my influence on them. And of course, shortly after that, Matthew started playing drums, you know, same thing at the age of six. I knew he had a, a talent for it. We called in uh, a guy who was playing in, in a band I had at the time called New Tricks, a guy named Sean Baltazar. Wonderful, wonderful drummer and a, and a tremendous teacher. He invited him over one day to give us a lesson. So I had this little drum set that I had bought for Julian when he was younger. And then I had my full-size drum set and we set him up in one room and Sean was going to give us a lesson so Sean gave us a lesson and showed us some rudiments and the, the next day I said okay Matthew now you, you're taking drum lessons so we have to we have to practice and so I started talking about something that Sean had t told us about and Matthew and I said no remember and, and we built it up it was something that required coordination among the limbs and I said remember you do this with the right hand okay now the left hand fits like this and I broke it down you know something that I'm pretty good at is breaking things down and 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 so Matthew got it and he was, I forget what it's like playing a, a ride cymbal beat and playing quarter note triplets against it or something and so the next day I said so remember what we were working on yesterday we start with the right and he goes oh you mean this and he just started playing it and I'm like okay go play I gotta I gotta figure this out <laughs> you know it's gonna take me some time to figure this out you know very quickly was able to play a lot of things similar thing with Sean I don't think he was used to teaching a lot of little kids so he didn't have a curriculum for six-year-olds so he just brought in what he knew to show. So he brought in a Max Roach solo and, and Matt started learning that. And so by the time this, that was like in the winter, and by the time summer came along and we were doing the Jazz Connections camp, which was the precursor to the Jazz House Kids camp. That. You know all about it. I kind of knock on the door when I was teaching my morning warm-up class. Billy Hart was at the door and he said, come with me. <laughs> so I told one of my TAs to run the class. And we sat outside the window and he, he was just pointing out things that Matthew was doing, you know, at six in, in a class with high school kids and just saying, how did this happen? Where, you know, so at that point I realized what Matthew was doing was 
pretty extraordinary. And that's been a, a, a wonderful ride too. My daughter, Jackie, also started playing violin early and stuck with it. She saw Rebecca, my wife, as her role model. And so she was very into classical music and did the Suzuki method. And, and she, you know, when I would try to teach her jazz when she was younger, she goes, I'm not a jazz musician. I'm a classical musician like mom. Rebecca's always been adamant. Like, she's going to be a violinist. I want her to know something about African-American tradition, jazz that's so important to our culture. She doesn't want her to be sectioned off in this exclusive kind of music that didn't have as many real-life applications to regular folks. So... And she wanted her to improvise and has seen what's happening during our lifetimes of, of orchestras shrinking and orchestral gigs and harder and harder to get as there's more great musicians vying for less and less jobs. So, she, you know, she sees that there's other, other work and wanted her daughter to, uh, to improvise. And, of course, I wanted to yeah. improvise with her because that's what I like to do. So at one point I was trying to get her to work with me and she, uh, you know, she pushed back and she said, well, you didn't really do this for me like he did it for my brothers you know you made them and I was like oh so you're actually not mad that I'm making you practice today you're mad that I haven't made you practice all the way along and this was at an age where she was she was 10 or 11 and she was a very good yeah. um, violinist and could play in flat keys already by the time this happened mm -hmm. so I think it's actually good that it, we waited until she was able to do it because it was it's so hard and I've taught class to little violinists before but you have to do everything in in certain keys and a lot of the chromaticism that you try to play in you know jazz setting is very difficult so she was ready she was she was more than ready and i remember one of the first things i had her do was learn this sunny stitt solo on on all the things you are and as you're very familiar with that solo it's really remarkable what's, what's happened to her and her growth in both jazz and and classical settings you know i think her classical teachers noticed that you know she's really become more comfortable and, and is playing better in tune because she can hear things in a different way and Julian and I always joke that it's cross training, you know, like mm. the more she practices classical, the better her jazz gets and the right. more she practices improvising, the better her classical gets. So that that's really wonderful. And it's and obviously it's drawn, drawn us very close and and drawn her closer to her brothers. And it's it's really yeah, it's yeah. yeah, it's it's as you know, people always say, oh, that must be wonderful. And, you know, it's it's as good as it sounds. It's really a remarkable thing. And I think. You know, there's some things that made it easy to do, and one is that my wife totally on board about um, kids practicing every day. You know, we're no lo we're no more going to say, yeah, it's cool if you don't practice today, than we're going to say, yeah, it's cool if you don't do your math homework. You know, we're, you know, I think we're in a culture where if your child isn't excelling at science or or math or or reading and, and language arts that you get a tutor, that you sit down with them every day, that you're supposed to be there with them, working with them, practicing with them. But it seems like everyone's like, oh, music, well, if they, if they like it, you know, or they're not good at it. It's like, you know, we don't see if our kids are good at math before we make them take a math class. They're just supposed to develop that. And yeah. it's almost, you know, we, we know as musicians that we have to work on the things we're not good at. So if we're good at yes. calculating and doing theory, that doesn't mean we don't work on our ear, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I'm just not good at ear, so I'm going to not do that. Or I'm just not good at theory, so I'm just going to play by ear. We don't do that, and we don't do that as a culture. I, I've known a lot of great musicians since they were very little, you know. Mm -hmm. And just the other night, I was at the Village Vanguard and saw Emmett Cohen's trio. And and Emmett had um, had a pretty good bass player named Ron Carter with him. And he had. I think he's all right. <laughs> yeah, and he had, and he had, and he had his longtime friend Evan Sherman. Okay. And I knew Evan and, and Emmett when they were little guys. At least in Emmett's case, and I think this is probably true of Evan as well. Parents never made him practice. You know, they used to yell at him to, to stop practicing and get his homework done. And and that's that's kind of the situation I had growing up too. That's great. You know, that's great when it works. But to me, it was always a matter of I know they're going to see two musicians growing up. When I was a young man, when I was around your age. I was getting ready to start a family. I did a lot of wedding gigs with people as old as I am now. Saw them talking about, oh, my 16-year-old kid decided they want to be a jazz musician. Now we're trying to get them lessons. And, trying, you know. and that's fine. Like, if you get into it six, I got a, I wasn't, I wasn't a baby when I said, you can get into it older and still have a wonderful career. I remember thinking to myself, you know, if my kid decides they want to do that, they're going to have a grounding in it. They're going to, they're going to be ready. And that was always the plan. I mean, I never planned to have three kids want to become professional musicians and one already is, and, and, and the second one basically is, and just finished all his auditions to go to school as a, as a musician. And, and then the third one has declared that that's what she wants to do. So that was never the plan, but I, I wanted them to be in a position, if they're going to grow up in this, in my household, which was a musical household, that they would 
they would have the skills to do it. So it was, it was daily practice and it was two parents that agreed about it. The only thing, you know, we still tussle about whether Jackie's going to practice classical music or she's got a lesson tomorrow. It's like, she's got a gig on Thursday. <laughs> you know? So we'll, we'll argue about whether she's going to practice improvising or practice um, her classical repertoire. It sounds like to me that you are really motivated by your kids too, like Absolutely. just for your own musical, um, you know, progression as well. It's like, yes. it's kind of put you at another level. You feel like, right. right? I think like even you, in the time you've known me, we've known each yeah. other about eight, nine, 10 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even Not the time you've known, you've seen the transformation in my career mm -hmm. for, you know, the, the, the level and quality of, of work I've, I'm doing now is, you know, yeah. it's, is, is much, much better. Um, than it was 10 years ago. And I think a lot of it's that, I think a lot of it also is how people interact with you when they see, when they see your kids, they know that it's in your house. And this is some themes that we should talk about in terms of all business, you know, it's about whether you're giving or taking. So I think people perceive it when, when they see your children flourishing, they know that you're giving them something and you're giving the music something. You're not just going into the music and saying, I want this gig and I want to do this and I want to, I want to be famous and I want this. But you're saying, you know, I've raised these people in this culture, in this music, uh, and put in daily effort to, to be with them and, and to give this next generation lift. The first thing Roy Hargrove ever said to me, and, and I think especially as an older musician that he wasn't really aware of, you know, the first thing he ever said to me is, man, what you're doing with those kids is remarkable. And that, you know, that led to him remembering my name and, <laughs> you know, to... <laughs> I remember I remember hosting a jam session at, at, at Zinc Bar one time um, for Van Doren. I, did I was the, there. Uh, you were there, yeah, the Van Doren jam. And remember Roy came in and asked if he could sit in. And I'd never seen that because all I knew was, you know, she's Roy Hargrove. He just takes out stuff. He feels like, and he was like, hey, Mike, can I play? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, of course. And then that led to actually playing um, with his with his big band and doing some gigs with him. And the same with uh, the Dizzy Band. Our introduction to John Lee was him hearing Matthew at age nine at a jazz house kids function. He heard Matthew and he said, excuse me, are you that drummer's dad? And we started having a conversation. What's so funny is, John, you know, he has the same name as my father, John Lee. And, and so he invited, he yeah. invited us and me and Julian and, and Matthew went and sat in with him his local gig. It was at a place called Papillon back then. And then he started to hear Julian, you know, eventually through all these events and the, and the um, Giants of Jazz events that he would host. And that I would participate in. Um, he started hiring me to play in the Dizzy Band, which yeah. being in a network like that opens up to a lot of gigs. And then the Jimmy Heath Big Band as well. Yeah. Um, through that, so it's yeah, it's been more than inspirational. It's actually been an introduction. And I think people can be protective of the of the music too. You know, the, if they feel yeah. someone's coming in and just trying to get from it. As I mentioned, you know, uh, being in a different place about the music and thinking you know, I should be getting more, or I play better than that person. Why is that person having it? And all these things that we all see and, you know, hopefully we keep in our head and we don't put Facebook posts about it, but <laughs> there's a lot of that too. Yeah, just to bring together some of the points, I think the audience would kind of like to hear about at one point in your life, you feel a little uh, disgruntled, uh, kind of like towards the scene, but really it's, it was like a reflection of yourself. Like I'm, disgruntled with myself so you were trying to blame other factors and then that's um, fair. Yeah, that's yeah fair. but then you looked in the mirror you're like i don't want to be this kind of person and right. i think that's really powerful thing that um i think even like musicians my age nowadays like it's like we developed that so early yeah. you know that kind well of, listen uh, negativity, i think you know? i think a lot of times you know people in my generation will talk about oh we weren't like that when we were we, we weren't you know these kids today, here's the problem with, with that line of reasoning is that, yeah, we were like that. The thing is, th those of us that were really like, and as you know, we're discussing, I was kind of falling into that, that rut of, of thinking I wasn't getting what I was deserved and blaming it on external yeah, factors. Exactly. And people that wallow in those thoughts 20 years later, 30 years later, when they're in the 50s, are doing something else. So when a bunch of people in my generation that are have the absolute joy and and some luck, I mean, I'm not going to say it's it's yeah. it's not there's not some luck that's associated with it. You know, it's been weeded out. The, the people that thought that way are doing other things. Right, right. And and so when you look at a younger generation, you still have the whole pool, and it's it's easy to get to to judge the generation 
by a lot of people that may not be doing this in 20 years because they're they're letting thoughts like, you know, I deserve more than I'm getting, bring them down. And it's okay to say I deserve more than I'm mm-hmm. getting if it's an empowering. If it's like, right. you know what, I don't deserve to be, you know, driving Uber, you know, or, you know, or, 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 you know, like I was, I was word processing. It used to be a gig back, back in the day. Not everyone could run a computer. So if you knew how to like run word processing software, <laughs> they would pay you, right. you know, better than flipping hamburger money. So when you're saying, um, I deserve more than that. Um, and you say, and you said, so I'm going to practice harder and I'm going to tend to my business and I'm going to take action. That's, that can be empowering. But when it's, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not. I'm not getting what I deserve because of X, Y, or Z. And it's easy to fill in things. And, you know, of all the different groups that complain, and and we all complain. And if you get a bunch of white men together who are jazz musicians, (laughs) it it doesn't take long before, you know. And and I remember when I first started to become close to a lot of great black musicians, and I told one of them that that that's a conversation we have, he was flabbergasted. (laughs) It's like, he was like, what so um and and then yeah. you know and it was it was actually a little bit enlightening to me where you know i was off, often having the conversation well this is hard with an all-white band or or you know this is hard as, as a as a white musician to be taken seriously playing mm-hmm. swing music that a lot of black musicians have the exact same but reverse conversation so and i'm not you know there's there's no way for me to gauge what is and isn't true or, or valid and and you know especially if if a woman says yeah there's a lot of opportunities i don't have i know that's true you know of mm-hmm. course what happens is then some someone decides i'm gonna do an all girl thing or this is women's history month and we're gonna do gigs like that and so some men will it, invariably you know say oh you know like you know so like <laughs> yeah. oh man look you know for instance um automatic reaction uh nicholas payton has an all-female saxophone section you know, uh, you know, I can't get in that. And it's like, when people say, actually say that out loud, I usually want to say like, yeah, you weren't getting that gig anyway. You know, like, you know. <laughs> With and, that kind of mentality. <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing for any anyone who's serious about getting ahead in business has to, has to understand that, has to take the feedback that the universe is giving them seriously. Mm. So it's not to say, well, you're not working because you suck. But it might it might be to say, well, you know, yeah, you you were playing well enough to work in Cleveland, but now you're in New York, and you just haven't put enough work in. Yeah. Like that's an empowering place to come from, especially if it's coming from yourself, right? Mm. Maybe if someone else is telling you, it can make you feel that you know old people are all mean to us, and yeah, you know. But if you're not doing the kind of gigs you are, part of it is probably because you don't have those skills together as well as the people that are getting the gigs it's taking responsibility for you know for the feedback and 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 it is true that you can become a wonderful player develop very high level skills and not be able to get the gigs that become available i think it's very empowering to say i'm working just exactly as much as my skills and my presentation warrant i'm into i'm into a lot of different philosophies and 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 eastern thought and a, a lot of people aren't accepting what is, you know, just like the, the general principle of like, this is what is, and not right or wrong, this is what is. And what are, the, what are the steps I can take to rectify what I would like to see happening? Um, but the, I think the more we spend on, it's not happening because of this, that, or the other thing, the less empowered we are to make the changes and to, to advance. I'm living proof that it can happen that you can go from Oh, I should have better. I should be doing better things. To, wow, I got that call. Wow, I know like fifty people <laughs> that could yeah. do that. Might be more qualified or know the people in the band, and and all of a sudden I'm getting some great calls. There's the come from as we were talking before about about I'm here to serve. I'm here to to uplift. I'm here to serve not just the audience, which is highly essential. Right? You want you want to uplift them. And that doesn't mean appease them. To me, it doesn't mean give them exactly what they want. It means it, it can include challenging them and stretching them and, and, and bringing them to n- other places or finding a way to connect with something they already know to bring music. For instance, playing with Nat Adderley Jr., who was Luther Vandross's musical director for his entire career. He's known in that world. In that world, he's a, he's a star, you know, 
so a lot so the people that come are a combination of people that know him because of his name Nat Adderley Jr. and they know his his uncle and his father um, and we play that music but then half of the people are coming there because we play melodies they recognize that Luther Vandross sung and and so we're trying to you know try now to reach to them so part of it is is definitely that but and then it's also serving the history serving our ancestors you know and spending time around um, John Lee and, and Roy Hargrove and Oliver Lake and seeing their dedication to what came before and understanding that we are trying to embrace that lineage and not just because we believe in jazz music or, you know, in a broader sense, uh, black American music, but we believe in the American experiment. We believe in bringing people together and, and creating community. And, and so, so I think when you approach from that, good things start to happen and that's that's where the value is you know the world doesn't need another badass tenor player that can play Cherokee in 12 keys you know I learned that you know you know as, as a 35 year old that could do things that a lot of musicians couldn't do and wasn't working very much I learned that you know and that doesn't mean I hadn't put together a lot of stuff you know that I didn't hadn't done the work and that there were things that I could do better than people that were working but that was the wrong attitude there you know, the attitude is what can I bring, what what can I, you know, what can I do to serve humanity? Yeah. That's where things start to change, I think. No, I think that makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, definitely into uh, more serving, less selling, right. you know, no doubt. You and, know? And, and, you know, in terms of education and being an educator, you know, as I mentioned, when I first started teaching, it was because I had to. I was trying to figure out a way to stay off the road a little bit and and be be at home um and it was frustrating and i didn't like it but as you know as i became as i started to work more the more i work the more i love to teach you know if i have a week where i have no gigs and i have like two days at Montclair state and two days at jazz house kids and a full <laughs> d docket of, of private students on another day and i have one day off i'm like oh you know save me but but if I'm if I have this exact same teaching schedule, but I'm like rushing out to go to make the gig and, and you know, run into the Carlisle and then do a gig at Mittens and then, you know, have an afternoon brunch gig and, you know, whatever else comes up. Um, for some reason, the teaching becomes much more interesting, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. I can totally relate to that. Right. So <laughs> you come in, you're like, you're, you know, or if I come if I come into Montclair State and my kids, um, my kids are great at Montclair State. Montclair State has the most lovely students. You know, they're, they're so positive and open. But let's say on a rare occasion, they didn't get together. They didn't work out the stuff I had assigned them that week. And I come and I said, man, you know where I just came? I got four hours of sleep because I was, I just got off a plane. And I had, to, you think if I done that, I, you know, so there's, it's like, there's, there's real visceral. And I think it makes a difference to the students when they know they're learning from someone who was just at, the blue note, you know, who just at just got off a plane to, to play a venue. Um, so it starts to feed on itself. And then you see teaching as a way of, of, of nurturing the next generation of musicians, but also the next generation of listeners, of business people. You know, you've been around Jazz House long enough to, to see all these wonderful musicians that we've had come through and all the different things they're doing. I mean, we, we have the Emmets and the Julians and the Zoes and the people that you see out on the scene and the... Um, Emmanuel Wilkins and all these amazing players that have come through our, our programs or summer camps. Um, but, you know, there's also people that are working for nonprofits and who are creating um, scenes and, and bringing, you know, jazz music and, and, you know, great music and music education to, to kids and all, you know, one, one person is, is, is deeply involved with getting instruments to needy kids. And, you know, so you see, you see, we're, we're not just fostering, you know, another burning tenor player that can, you know, <laughs> chop up rhythm changes. Um, we're, we're creating a community and, 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 and a value for an art form that is beautiful and, you know, organic and, and tells the story of America in the, in the most beautiful way, you know, mm -hmm. takes the, the, the tragedy of so many American um, historical events and, and turns them into, yeah. and finds the beauty. That is the nexus we have to find it. And I think if if you're teaching a lot and you wish you were playing more, I think deal with what you have. Like find 
find in the education what can I what can I show this person? And when I have when I have little kids that have not declared any kind of particular um, career goal or or interest, and I don't have as many of those, and I, I kind of miss that. I had one recently, and and I just discovered just like teach them about Kind of Blue, you know, one of the great artistic achievements of American history. A kid does not need to play saxophone for very long before they can play the melody to um, All Blues. Yeah. And then you can play All Blues over the whole track. You can just play the melody while these great solos are going on. And that gives them an introduction into form, into, into harmony, right. into, into you know, melodic statement on their first lesson. You know, maybe they've been playing saxophone for two weeks. They can already play. I mean, that's not a difficult melody to to execute so like i remember i used to only have little kids and it was frustrating because they wouldn't practice so i took on a, a young student a couple of years ago and i hadn't taught anyone like that because i was you know i'm so fortunate to have all these 16 and 17 year old career directed saxophonists that want to study with me you know and i usually tell them i, I charge a lot of money you know i and i'm like yeah you know I, I recommend some other and they're like no we we want you lo and behold this kid came in practicing every you know practice he still does he practices he, he was at the house last night and he, and he i don't think he's decided he wants to do this but he comes he practices every day you know and he comes in and now he's like transcribing a sunny stitch solo on his own you know and it's like okay if you asked me six months ago if this was possible i wouldn't have thought so 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 i think it's funny coming at it from my current attitude i get a, a younger student and if i i feel like if i could have been that way with younger students 10 years ago 15 years ago there'd be a lot more, you know, it would've been a lot more gratifying. You have to come from gratitude first. I have the opportunity to teach someone. I remember, I remember one time sitting with uh, Julian when he was a little boy, we were watching some news program. And I guess it was some point when the economy was starting to fluctuate in a negative way. And we watched the news and we saw this line of people. They showed this line of people that had applied for a $5 an hour job. I said, you know, if you can teach saxophone lessons, You'll never have to do a five dollar an hour job. It's important to know that that you're fortunate. You know, if you're in that situation, teaching small children, even if one of these music stores has taken way too big a cut, it's still a lot better than a lot of things could be. So I think you know, approaching with gratitude from the beginning, you know, and and realize that every student that walks through your door is the next Miles, is the next you know Peter Lynn, is the next positive influence you want to have. That's who they are, and that's where that's where we approach it from, rather than. Oh man, I gotta babysit this kid. I don't want to babysit, you know. I think it's very difficult, uh, I guess, for people that are coming out of these uh, jazz programs. It's, you know, it's like nowadays it's more um, you have to you have to get into education in some way or form. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if it's always been like that, but um, as far as I know, you know, yeah. I'm young, but <laughs> I don't know if there's less opportunities. But I do know that the opportunities have moved. Yeah. or in different spaces now sure so um like what what do you say to someone that is kind of does not look forward <laughs> to teaching like you know you're saying go in with gratitude yeah. but for a lot of uh students coming out i definitely see like i don't yeah. want to teach and what ends up happening is um they find it very hard to make a living just based off of a couple oh, of gigs, like, you know, right? right? Sure. I like the way you put about education. It's like you're just not educating them about just specific music notes and theory, but yeah. you're educating like a culture and you're cultivating. You yeah. know, I like the way that you put it like that. So, but may maybe there's something you could let the younger musicians know who that don't really want to get into teaching. Like, what's... Well, if, if, you know, if I took all my income from teaching away, I could not oh. pay my mortgage. If I just if I just had my income from playing that I have now, yeah. and I was living like I lived when I was twenty five, I'd be fine. Mm -hmm. So it all depends what your goal is and goal. And, mm -hmm. and and where you want to go. And and to me, balance was always part of it. The greatest event in my life was was marriage, and and you know I that, that was always mm -hmm. that was important to me. You know, relationships and, and and relating and family was always important to me before. I was married before I had a family. And so that was always a focus. And I always wanted to lead a balanced life. So whatever your dream is, go for your dream. So I don't want to put anyone down. But mm -hmm. to me, and I felt that, and I still feel that. I feel like I don't want to teach today. I think part of that, it's, it's a selfish notion. What do you want to contribute? There are philosophies that I adhere to strongly that say you're always te you're teaching whatever you do. You know, when you mm -hmm. go into a coffee shop, you're mm -hmm. teaching. When you when you're 
when you get up in the morning, you're teaching. Just how you lead your life is yeah. always teaching. So you always are teaching anyway. And, and what do you teach? Can you say, I love the trombone. I love the music of Slide Hampton and, and J.J. Johnson and trombone shorty or you know whoever whoever is can I, can I say I love that and I don't want to show it to a 12 year old that that to me is not a mm. that's not really a viable yeah that, that's not really a viable thing can I say I want this music to exist and I believe in its cultural um, importance mm. and its ability to transform the world but I don't want to show it to young people I, I guess you can, you know, I think, I think it's, I think it's valid. Like I'm touring all over the world. Yeah. I, I, I can't keep any regular students. I'm not going to do, I'm not choosing to do that right now. I think right. that's fine. But the whole, I don't want to teach. Like my first inkling was of feeling success and feeling, feeling like I was receiving what I was so hungry for, you know, as, as a 20 something year old musician, I felt very like, wow, I'm, practicing this hard I'm working this hard and I'm not getting the results I want and and even before this is long before Julian picked up a saxophone I found a niche and that niche was that I could sit in front of a room full of college students and talk about my experience and they would eat it up it, it kind of blew my mind right because here I was living in New York you know going and like I've talked about really going and playing gigs or jam sessions and getting like like a slow, <laughs> like it wasn't even a smattering. It was like a smatter, like a smatter of applause. Like, a, yeah. you know, and I, yeah, I was playing. I had to remember playing some great gigs with some amazing musicians who now we all know and doing some very encouraging things. But it was tough. You know, it was really tough. I, I had done, I was doing some tours with my former teacher, Joe Lovano. And, and I, st so I started to call universities along the way. And I'd be like, hey, I'm going to be in town with Joe Lovano. And, you know, would you be interested in having a saxophone clinic? And I was pretty good with language and left a good phone message. And it was actually the early days of email when people responded to all their emails. And, you know, you'd, you'd open your email inbox and there'd be, you haven't checked it for three days and there'd be two messages, you know. So it was like, it, it was a much more, it was a much easier way of, of reaching your potential clients. I remember the first tour I booked of that stuff. I was going to try to get out of town in January because there was no, I was doing weddings a lot. There was no wedding work in January. So I'm going to try to get out of town. And it ended up that the two weeks turned into three, turned into four. I ended up being on the road for 60 straight days and, and giving these clinics. And when I tell you that it was like, it was like pouring water on a dry sponge. It was just like, I had felt so depleted and dried out from trying to make a living and getting some kind of feedback, making some kind of money, you know, getting some kind of notoriety that I got out on the road and the kids were fighting about who got to drive me to the airport or who got to, you know, take me over to a hotel room and they wanted to stay and pick my brain and, you know, and I would go give a clinic and then I'd do a gig with a local rhythm section and the whole student body would show up. It was like that, that experience was, was pretty special. And that made me realize how important giving the music to next generation. I mean, there's still people that come to, oh, you, you know, they'll have gray in their beer and be like, hey, you gave a clinic at my college and, you know. So, you know, the, the way that we present value is we're always educating, you know, and hopefully we're talking to, uh, we're talking to the audiences when we're performing as, as musicians and educating them and letting them know what's happening. Right. Um, I remember one time Ali Jackson came over to Hat City Kitchen when we had the jam session over there. Or maybe it wasn't even a, oh, you know what it was? It was a jam session, but we had an opening act. And there was a band from a local college that was that was playing the hour before we played right. our set. Right. And and Ali lived in the neighborhood. And so he, he came in and he goes, what are they telling people? Like they aren't giving any information. These people, they're not, you know, there's a local neighbor, you know, Hat City Kitchen. We drew a lot of people that were there for the music, but it was also a neighborhood bar. He's like, there's no context. There's, there's no meaning being given. So we're, we're always teaching and the design, you know, I think a lot of, that, Oh, I don't want to teach is no, I'm a badass. I just want everyone to come and love me and dig the way that I can right. shred, you know, more than, you yeah. know, Chad Lefkowitz, you know, but then you meet Chad Lefkowitz and right. Chad wants to teach everyone everything. You know, he's a beautiful, the part of, part of that is, is being, 
is wanting to show, wanting to yeah. help people and encourage people and bring them in to the to the bigger tent. So I don't know. I think that I don't want to teach thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good answer to that. I like that. Christian yeah. McBride has has a great quote too. He said, he said, you know, back in the day. He said, and this was really the experience that I had when I first came. All the all the great cats were they were playing jazz gigs at night, and then during the day they were going to the studio. They were playing commercials and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I mean, Michael Brecker and, and David Sanborn. I mean, that was like on a bunch of commercials and movie scores. That's the that, those are the guys in the in the sax section. Um, you know, he said. So it used to be studio. Now guys have college gigs. Look, college gigs especially in this area, are tough to get. Trying to get adjunct is really, really tough, but it's it's a, an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And if you take it like that, you know, I one of the first t- classes I taught at Montclair State when I was a, for six years ago, I became a professor. Um, they had me teach the intro to jazz class, which is the, you know, the gen ed class that, yeah. that you fulfills a requirement for every every student on campus. So it was a lecture class, you know, had 50 or 70 students in it. Um, man, I learned more about music and the music that I love teaching that class. It was, I remember it was a three hour lecture every Friday. You know, it was actually technically two and a half hour lecture from 10 a.m. to 12.30. And I would be, I'd be up all night every Thursday night reading, watching videos, assembling my lecture for the next day. Mm. And then I'd get up there, you know, like all caffeined up with not enough sleep in this kind of jittery space and i was crazy i mean i was so enthusiastic i mean i think it was a pretty effective thing i mean you know how that is you got kids most most of those kids start their party thursday night you know it's like they're not waiting till friday so it's friday morning and they're they're sitting in there and i i'd have my saxophone i'd play for them i'd put on I put on Miles Davis playing Bye Bye Blackbird. I make them all sing Bye Bye Blackbird. I put the lyrics up on the on the screen. Make them all sing Bye Bye Blackbird. I'd take out my horn and play the melody while they sang it. Then <laughs> then we'd all sing it while while we listened to Miles Davis version and through all the solos and like we'd be singing it and then all of a sudden like right in the middle of all his beautiful lines and his you know vertical approach, Coltrane would just just land right on that part of the melody and they'd be like their minds would be blown you know. So wow. A gen ed class. Oh, I mean, listen. When, when they when they said as an yeah. adjunct professor, you you can only do so much. So do you want do you want more students or do you want to keep teaching that gen ed? I was like, I want more students. You know, I was like, that was enough. But that year was amazing. I wow. learned so much about it. And then, you know, listen. When you talk to, you, you know, Christian personally. You know, when you sit down and talk to these geniuses of jazz, you're talking personally. I mean, they'll take someone who you know is an expert, teaches a class and stuff. And make me feel like I'm four years old learning oh about the music for the, because the, the yeah. depth of knowledge and that that they have, and I think that's that's part of it. And if you're unwilling to mm-hmm. teach it, to me, it's like it's, it's like what yeah, what what are we here for? What are what are we here for? Well, I know that you run the weekly jam session over at the Mockler Social Club yep. every Wednesday, and it's been at different locations over the years. But for the most part, you've been doing that for a, a long time. Yeah. Even did you even did uh, Cecil's? Well, that was like more Bruce's. Right, I would, I'd sub for Bruce quite a bit. Was, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that yeah. Was, so you've been was, doing a long time here yeah. in Jersey. So maybe you could talk um, just about that whole jam session. Uh, how you got into it and then like what that done to the community and then after that you could talk about the etiquette okay well i you know my experience of getting into into jam session i mean i attended a lot of jam sessions in cleveland when i was growing up actually the the tri-c jazz festival which is the big jazz festival in cleveland every year would have me run a jam session as a i was and i was a kid i mean i'm talking maybe 25 running a jam session that with the artists in residence so one year it was bobby watson one year it was jerry allen one year it was uh, marcus belgrave so these you know great musicians would come in and they and they were performing a lot of contexts with different cleveland bands and with you know their own bands and and one of the nights was they would they would play a set with my band and then that would become the jam session and because I was considered someone on the scene even at that age that kind of knew the different facets of the Cleveland scene um, younger and older musicians they they liked me running the session so yeah it was something I guess I was I was I was always pretty good at and um, could do uh, yeah and then I attended a lot of jam sessions and like I mentioned the star cafe that was epic I mean the memories from there it was just 
you know, out of this world, you know, and seeing all those amazing musicians, including, including our friend Steve Ture. And one of my most vivid memories of him was, and this is, a, this goes, this goes back to our theme about, um, you know, deciding someone else's to blame for whatever's going on in your life. So, so they were playing Cherokee pretty brisk yeah. and, um, you know, people weren't sounding good. People were stumbling and, and I, I practiced Cherokee a lot. I was like, I'm going to be okay. And I got up there and I was like, uh, and I'm just like, you know, maybe it was fine. Maybe it wasn't. It was just what it was. And um, that drummer's turning the beat around. But, you know, like, everyone, you know, we're all commiserating. But and Steve Ture just stands up there and brings out his drum. I was like, spit, boop, bet, bop. You know, plays like five notes. And the rhythm section just went boom like that. And then he just, like, shredded Cherokee. Like, you know, first he put them in. And that was that was a big lesson. It was like, okay, you know. So, I mean, jam sessions have always been exciting to me. I mean, it's an art. It's very easy to get um, pissed off and blame the situation. You know, it's always remarkable to me that you mentioned a jam session and people like make these blanket statements about jam sessions like, oh, jam sessions are BS. Just have it, you know, just call your friends over and play in your room and jam sessions are, you know, and there's no real music making and it's just a cutting contest and it's not about real, you know, and you see all these things and look. Uh, is it for everybody? I don't know. One of the major failings of jam sessions to me is that, you know, we're, we're not getting enough women included. Um, and that's a whole, we could do a whole other s section about that. A lot of people, of every demographic definition feel excluded from jam sessions. Um, they're hard. It's, it's hard to get over at a jam session. You know, when Bruce Williams comes into a jam session, yeah, he's that good. I mean, he's he's that wonderful. But also, people know him. Like, at my jam session, people know him. And I guess jam session around the world, people know him. And he comes in, and they're like, okay, this is going to be killing. Everyone stops and listens. And 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 he sounds amazing. And, and it's probably fulfilling artistically at some level for him. Um, I feel that often now when I go sit in. It's usually pretty good. And, and you know, and I, I also have a lot of opportunities to sit in in non-jam session situations. I can usually you know, get a couple tunes in at Mesro or Smalls when I go in before the actual jam session starts. So, you know, that's a goal. But but to me, negotiating everything, like if you hate jam sessions, I, I have a challenge for you. And that is, what is everything about the jam session that that you find difficult? And how can you overcome that? How, how can you get to a place where you are one of the respected professionals that comes in there, maybe plays before the session is open, or probably, you know, and and what is the what are the factors by which you get there, and and what are the what are the things that hold you back from getting over, and not that getting over is the be all and end all, and it's not always an indication of of great musicianship, um, but it is a certain skill set. What part does competition play? You know. Because I've, I've heard from, uh, from Wallace Roney told me about a conversation he had with Sonny Rollins about Tenor Madness. You know, and it's like, yeah, I think, I think, I think Train cut me pretty bad at that. You know, Th these great musicians, the absolute icons, we're thinking about getting cut and not getting cut and cutting each other. And maybe it's not the same part of your heart that gets moved. But there's something moving about Tenor Madness. There's some beauty in there. And yeah, there's competition. You know, there's the stories of Kenny Dorham and Miles Davis going, you know, like, oh, you know, Kenny Dorham came in and cut Miles on his gig and then and and Miles made sure to invite Kenny back the next night and, and cut him up. You know, you, you hear you hear these stories and it's part of these incredibly beautiful, generous musicians. So to me, competition is is part of it and dealing with that is part of it. And and not getting called up on the tune you know. So how many tunes do you know? So some of the skills you have to have to really succeed is to know the tunes. Go to the jam session. Learn learn the tunes. You know, write down the tunes they play. Go home and learn them. Um, you know, a lot of young musicians start up their own jam sessions. I think that's great. I find that the musicians that do that, they come to my jam session and they act differently. You know, they, they're, they're, they're more respectful. They understand the challenges. You know, like anything in life, the more you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, the better off you are. You know, you have to understand that a jam session leader, I think one of the reasons that I've been successful in that role is because I manage all the different facets. So you got to be good on a microphone. You got to you got to remember people. 
I wish I was better remembering people's names. I just appreciate it when young people come up that I know and I know I should know their names. They say their name to me and I can go like, oh yeah, Peter, I know you. You know, even though I was like, at that moment going like, what is his name? I should know his name. Um, you know people, you, you know, and you know what they can do and that you, you care and that you're sensitive, but not overly sensitive. A lot of jam sessions fail because um, the leader's so worried about hurting anybody's feelings that they let the inmates run the asylum. And the next thing you know it is that the, the strong musicians, the people that come there that, you, you know, the, you know, Steve Trey comes to our session so much. It's great. You come to my session. You know, there's amazing musicians that come to my session and, and I don't want to turn it into a thing that, you know, just makes people that are just learning to play feel good. You know, I want them to feel good, but I want them to feel empowered. And I want them to understand that, you know, the hierarchy ex exists because of the work people have put in. Um, you know, and usually if you go every week, you're, you're going to, you know, you're going to get to play and you're going to, you're going to develop friendships. If you go to a jam session, seeing how you can make the scene better mm. rather yeah. than trying to figure out how you can, go, you know, listen, I know, trust me, I know. I was used to being, in, as I mentioned, I used to being in Cleveland, you know, even if it was some scene that I, I hadn't met the people yet, you know, playing a few notes and going like, wow, you know, like, mm. and I, I came to New York and it was like, it was amazing to me. Like the first solo would never get anywhere, mm -hmm. you know? And that's all it took in Cleveland for me to get gigs. And, and, I, and I, I started to realize that if I just hung around and I just didn't let that, that train of thought take over, that train of thought that mm -hmm. says, oh man, I should be getting more. Man, I should be, I should be, you know, I'm better than him. Well, you know, what's going on? Oh, that's, if I didn't let that train of thought invade and just stuck it out, usually the, it was after the third tune. Right, right. You know, and I feel like what I have to offer as a musician maybe is a little subtler. And also I, I warm up, I start to seek out, you know, and I, I take, I do take my time. I think even then I took my time. I wasn't just trying to play a bunch of notes right off the bat. Mm -hmm. I would play a solo and see who was listening to me, who was, you know, where, where the spots. And by the third time I would figure out, by the third tune, I kind of figure out and be able to put, you know, create an arc of a solo that created some kind of reaction. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I also understand now the jam session culture that oftentimes you don't get three. And, and back then, I often didn't get three. So a lot of times, I was like, oh, yeah. That, if I had played a couple more, it would have been cool, but it wasn't cool tonight. It wasn't my night. Uh, you know? And that's, mm, mm. you know, it's it's just putting in your time and, and understanding you're putting your time and not having this, you know, and I'm speaking from personal experience, but yeah. I imagine this is what's going on with people that go to jam sessions and say, oh, I'm never going to another jam session. It's just like the me see this need to feel appreciated for what you're doing. You know, mm. a lot of people who put in a lot of hard work don't get a lot of love at jam sessions. And, and that's, that's the truth. You know, the truth is this, this hard, Dave Stryker, <laughs> Dave Stryker, he has a great way of boiling things down into one sentence. Um, Dave Stryker is the reason I started hosting a jam session because okay. he called, because we had been doing the, the Cecil's jam session. Yeah. When did Cecil's close? Nine years ago? So 2011, uh, yeah, 2012. It's been a while now. 2012, maybe? Maybe shorter Or 2011. That. So yeah. Eight. Eight. Like yeah, eight years ago. So. And, and Bruce Williams had been running the Tuesday night jam session there for mm -hmm. however many years. Um, and, and I had subbed from quite a bit. And so when, when Dave called Bruce and said, listen, there's a place around the corner. We want to get a jazz policy going. Um, Bruce said, yeah, I did it for 10 years. I'm, I'm good, but call Mike. And so Dave <laughs> called me and, and we right. started it. And, and that was the beginning. But we would, so a lot of times we were sitting there and, and you know, you'd be sitting there having dinner after our set and all the, uh, younger musicians are playing and sometimes the young musicians <laughs> struggling, you know, like not sounding good. <laughs> and Stryker would always look at me and he goes, you know, this stuff is hard. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like it ain't, right. it ain't easy, you know, yeah. and just to sound okay is very difficult. It, yeah. You know, it's not, it's not music you start studying one month and the next month you're, you're tearing Agreed. it up you know it's just it yeah. takes a lot of work and people who feel rightfully so that they've put in a lot of work and feel that they deserve some kind of attention don't get it yeah. and and it's just keep practicing keep yeah. coming back you know you know make make it a challenge you know about about your ego and, and letting yeah. letting that take over and just think about the leader says like oh yeah did you play on that tune you know, you're going like, I played my, it was the best solo I ever played and no one heard it, you know. 
those those kinds of things. So maybe maybe that's happened, but maybe like what's the thing I can do? Well, maybe you can go up to that slightly younger musician and give him an encouraging word, or you can you know mm -hmm. invite the you know this young bass player to come play a session with you. Um, you know, someplace else, you know, maybe there's something else you can gain from that. Or maybe you can go ask someone to give you some pointers, you know, um, you know, a lot of times we'll give pointers whether we're asked or not. And sometimes people, <laughs> people really appreciate that. And sometimes yeah. they don't, but, for sure. but, but sometimes just asking for a couple pointers makes mm -hmm. you go like, Oh, so yeah, this person doesn't sound good yet or they don't sound great yet, but their head's on right. And they're, and, 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 they're, and, and then, you know, you become part of the community that way. Yeah. Actually, that's that's, that's funny because uh, one time Steve Ture asked me, how do I sound? And I'm just like, I don't want to answer this question. And he was like, We're, I, I'm asking you. How, like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, yeah. you got you to gotta tell me, you know, like we're friends. And even he was looking for yeah. feedback. You yeah. know, that's the point of that story. It's like, well, and, and then a lot of know. us that know each other real well, we're coming in with a different horn. Like, you know, I've been playing these yeah. people more out horns yeah. and we'd like want to know, you know, we're trying to, work out our stuff and get some get some feedback feedback yeah, yeah. thank you for sharing all that about yeah. the jam session scene the etiquette was pretty much you, you covered a lot of like that makes sense like if you come in with some kind of uh, feeling you know that like okay this is i don't feel good about the jam session what i is finding but, out yeah, what, i think yeah the, big, the biggest advice is just knowing how many different hats the leader is wearing yes. so i'm trying to first of all i'm trying to sound good with my band at the beginning and as nervous as, you know, nothing's more nerve wracking than having, you know, forecasts from William Patterson and NJCU and Montclair State and, and Rutgers, you know, like eight saxophone. This would happen all the time at, at Hat City where they'd all come up, all the saxophone players would come up for my set and sit right in front. Because I know how college kids think. I know they're like thinking, like, this guy, what is he doing? You know, so so first of all, I'm as nervous as I am for any gig and, and, the, and the crowd is, is tough. You know, these are young musicians that have studied the music. And then um, after, after that, I have to make sure the band gets fed. I have to make sure the band isn't getting worn out, that my bass player gets enough relief, that the, that the drummer feels like he's been featured. You know, like I have to take care of that, which that's hard. And then I got to figure out who's playing the tune. Then I have to worry about the club. One thing I love about Montclair Social Club is the management is actually like, I don't like all the space between tunes. We have people dining and they, they made it clear to me from the beginning they want a presentation that reaches beyond just the, the people that are there and i thought that was that's been great because it helps me go like do you guys know what you're playing count out you know me like like you guys would be sitting around talking about a tune i was going like count it off like i don't care is this we need some music right now um yeah that's the other thing is like know what you're going to play make sure you're calling tunes be willing to play tunes that everybody knows you know i remember i remember some I mean, these guys are my friends now, but I remember a couple of guys when they were young hotshots and they were like, you know, someone wanted to play Blue Boss and like, oh man, I don't want to play that. I'm like, okay, cool, play Stella by Starlight. Oh, I don't know that. <laughs> like, you can't, no, like. You can't say you don't want to play something and, and then not if, you don't, if you don't know, feel like, you know, I know I know 800 standards. If I want to say, no, I don't want to play that, okay. Yeah. But but some 20-year-old that knows 16 tunes and but feels like they play Blue Boss too much, don't want to play like, you know, Joe Henderson played that his whole life and right. sounded freaking amazing yeah. on it every time. Yeah. Like, really? Is there a problem playing that? Too? You know, it's not really like it's great. It's great if you can be up there with your friends and, and you get up there and you, and you call straight street. That's cool. But if it's clear that's not going to happen, play all the things you are. Come on. Yeah. All things you are okay. is an amazing composition. There's lots. There's lots of nooks and crannies. Yeah. You can't sound good on that. Like, yeah, that's it's not here for. But it, I mean, it is for repertoire expansion, but it's. You know, so yeah. play a tune that everyone knows, make it work for you, and just just realize that any any request you have, I have to think I have to think of sixteen different angles. Any any decision I make, oh, this drummer's here, that guy was here first, but this guy has to leave. This one's a little kid, needs to leave. You know, needs to go. Uh, yeah, yeah. This one's still in high school, it needs to go home before, um, you know, eleven o'clock. Like, are they junior in high school? I know they drove here. That means a license doesn't let them drive after eleven. I gotta right. gotta get them here and get them out. I don't want kids getting got moderate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's so many different considerations yeah. about get who to get up when and having it work. Um, you know, we could do a whole segment on vocals. I really want vocalists. I just want vocalists to play by the same rules as the horn players. So sometimes, you know, if you go up and like, I don't know what key, or I want to, I want to do like, hi, I just met you. I want to do Misty. It's like, yeah, if I just met you 
as a saxophone player, you're not going to be featured on a ballad. Right, right. Like Steve Trey comes in, he might get featured on a ballad. Yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. Bruce Williams comes in, they might get featured on, on a ballad. But I just met you, and you're a singer who's not sure. What you, key you yeah, what key you're in, or that you play jazz, yeah. or but you know, summertime. It's like, yeah, yeah you're going to play the head, and then everyone's going to solo, and we're going to trade fours with the drums, and we're going to do everything that the you know, you're a musician, just like any other musician. By the same token. Um, you're a young horn player, and you know this from coming to my session. Yeah, get up there. It's my shining hour, and we're in A flat. Yeah, deal yeah. with it. You deal know, it's, it. that's it's a vocalist. Yeah. We're gonna put the vote. You know, that's, right. that, that's that's one place we definitely want to accommodate the vocalist because we want the vocalist mm-hmm. to sound good. So we're gonna put him or her in their key. Yeah, and and the horn players are expected to be able to play another key. Yeah, yeah. So make Mike's job easier, please. <laughs> Very important. One thing that. Uh, one thing I know that you're really good at and you're very proud of is your newsletters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe you could just talk about how you, uh, you know, put them together. Uh, maybe some suggested programs to use. Um, you know, because I think nowadays it's uh, newsletters are actually coming back because mm-hmm. with social media kind of determining what you're going to see newsletters is the best way to reach people directly mm. and uh, i've been hearing this a lot so maybe you could talk a little bit about that uh yeah i mean newsletters are a great way to uh connect with your audience you know i like to write i often get really positive feedback about my writing and so i try to do it more mm. i um i think news letters are best when combined with a blog for my website i use uh, a software suite or whatever called WordPress. So WordPress has two ways to use WordPress. You can either just host your blog on their website, uh, WordPress.com site, or you can go to WordPress.org and download the stuff and put it on your website, which is how right. I use I use it on my website. And I, you know, I've gotten under the hood a little bit in the past with with website. Back in the old days, I actually built an HTML site from scratch. So I have oh, a little bit of, of I did that. Not know coding was in your genes. I would you call it coding? I guess it was coding. Yeah. I was using I was using it's the basic the coding, mock-up yeah. language for HTML. Yeah, um, yeah. That man, I wish That's I good. could have saved that site because it was it was pretty cool. Um, it did. I remember it was one October, probably like in two thousand eight or something, and I didn't get anything done that month. I mean, it just got so obsessive. I have to resist the desire to personalize and modify it and try to get under the hood to make some, Oh, I want this line over here. You know, it's like, yep, you I, can't do it. It doesn't do that. Let it go. Um, I get it. <laughs> but, I get it. but I found we're and now things oh, are just man. getting, you know, the technology is just getting so much better and easier to use. And, um, WordPress looks great. And then I use a plugin called mail poet, yeah. which has been extraordinary. And, and because my list has under a thousand people, it's free. And it's, yeah, it's free guys. Just. Yeah. <laughs> You know. uh, and it does it does great things. One of the things it does really well is it it'll you can make a newsletter and it'll take your last three blog posts and give a snippet mm-hmm. and then a, a you know click here to read more and that's a great way to get clicks on emails to to bring them over to your website and and create interest. So I think that's really important to me. To me, it's it's the discipline of blogging regularly and and telling your story. And and one of my major problems in my own development is, is just the willingness to share a story with the fear of oversharing. You know, we all see on social media the, the overshare, and it's like I think I err on the other side. But I think if if you're blogging regularly and you have a nice lo- newsletter to tell people about what you do, and and again, you know, the whole theme is creating value. You know, if it's valuable, people will read it. Yeah, and I, I understand a lot of people on my on my mailing list are not in the New York metropolitan area and are not able to come to gigs that I most of the gigs I promote which are in this area. Although I promote ones that are far away, but like you know, if I'm playing in in Florida, I don't have seventy people in West Palm Beach on my list. I might have four or five, you know. But that's right. still that's still important, and especially if I go home, I go to Ohio. There's a lot of people on a mailing list, so it's a good way to get um, information out to them. But in other words, it's not just promotion and, and getting people to come to your gigs, but it's just creating value so they want to read. You know, like you're doing with this mm-hmm. business 101. You're creating, you know, you're creating value, and uh, I'm guessing that very soon a lot of people will be subscribing and, and, and want to see it because it has something that's about them and not about you particularly. It's about your experience yeah, and, right. and knowledge that you have and are gaining from um, yeah. other musicians, 
and presenting it. I mean, that's that's what we have to look to is is presenting value. And you know, to me, a lot of it's a lot of presenting value is karmic. You know, it doesn't come immediately; it comes in name recognition. It's like it's like doing a jam session. When we do a jam session, I don't make much money at jam session. A lot of times, I I go to Mark's social club and. My my family will come and you know yeah, it's, it's a couple of, the couple of, yeah a couple of dinners and yeah. then I have a musicians coming from New York City so I throw them a couple of extra bucks and you know next thing I know that's not that's you know it's grocery stores call it a loss leader you know they put a <laughs> they put an advertisement up for a product that sells for less than it costs them mm. but bringing people in the store m- yep. makes them money so right. a lot of what we do is just presenting value creating name recognition creating opportunities creating connections. And, and suddenly you're an expert and you find yourself on a pa- panel or, you know, someone's giving you a few hundred dollars to sit on a panel. It's all about creating value and, yes. and, and, and creating energy and reaching, reaching more people and having people. Mm-hmm. It, it's not like, we, let me get this person to read about me. Let me get, give this person something to read about that is, is better than the average fare they're, they're coming up in, in their Facebook feed or their Instagram. Yeah. You know, so that they want to sure. read it. So they have value. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's cool how you found uh, certain aspects that are music related, but not quite all the way music related that you were able to kind of like feed off that level of expertise that you had in certain areas. Like, oh, I'm pretty good at writing. Yeah. Let me write about this. And because your uh, levels higher than other people at writing, then it's like then people can uh, recognize that and feel that and see a reflection of, oh, that's cool, you know, right. and let me be a part of that and be part of that community. So one, one of the questions that we usually ask all of our interviewees uh, is, what is your definition of success? Well, it's interesting. Probably if you'd asked me 20 years ago, um, I think 20 years ago, I used to say, you know, my goal is mastery. My goal is is not, is not, necessarily be the best, best or the fastest or the most this or the most that, but it is to, to lead a life that's congruent with great music. And I think that, you know, I, I think it's wrong to ever say, you know, you, you've attained mastery, but I feel like I'm on that path. Maybe this is an overshare, but, you know, my wife was real adamant about having children and I was real adamant about I'm not ready. And <laughs> and, and you know, well, as as in most really arguments in, in in our house, eventually she wins, and 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 it's so ironic that you know I thought having a family was going to interfere with my career, mm. when it's only made it better. So it's like this. So a lot of times, if you stay committed to what you're committed to, you find success in ways that you didn't imagine or plan. I didn't plan to have a, a family of musicians. You know, and these three young people are so amazing. And I can argue, I could sit here and make an argument for any one of them being clearly the most talented because they're so unique and have such uh, amazing abilities all on their own. Mm. Um, you know, so obviously that's a huge thing. Having a, a, a great family life, I think, is is the the best thing, you know, the most successful thing for me. That I think that was always the case, you know, even before... I knew any of these people that are living in my house now. I was serious about relationships and, you know, I was serious about working it out and I was serious about working on myself and meditation and, and, you know, mm. talking to professionals, you know, like I, you know, I, I really took that, that very seriously. Um, I think being able to be a successful saxophonist in New York city is such a difficult thing you know it's so so hard i'm so rewarded that I, i've been fortunate enough to play with so many masters and get get to play routinely as long as we don't close all of the clubs in new york because of the coronavirus yeah yeah which uh, seems oh, more, more and more imminent every day yes indeed um you know but just you know what what i've been having in terms of just real regular work yeah. just enough travel you know that yeah, i can maintain yeah. it having i have a i have an adjunct teaching gig with a four minute commute, you know, yep. I didn't That's move right. to, to where my teaching gig was. I got the teaching gig in the community I live in. And, and that is remarkable. And then you've been a major part of building this, uh, uh, Melissa Walker's amazing jazz house kids, non for profit teaching organization and being able to go in there and work with those students and, and the great faculty and the people I meet there is, you know, it's just an incredible blessing. And again, it's a four minute commute, you know, it's like, it's right in my neighborhood. You know, I go there and, and get to work with some of the, you know, strongest young musicians in the world, and some of the not as strong. I, I mean, I love it all. You know, it's just such a, it's such a blessing 
to have all that great teaching that's, you know, takes, you know, I know people that drive a long way to do their adjunct teaching gigs. And it's so such a blessing to have it be so close by and to have so many great students, you know, have have wonderful success and really feel, look, feel valued. You know, what what's what's really important in the core in here, how you feel, it's to feel valued, to feel um, like you're contributing, like you're making a difference. Um, and people respect you and want, want to be around you and are, are lifted by your presence. And and that's how I define um, success. This, this, is, this is, you know, it's the last five years pretty much have been a pinch me moment. Like, is this, is it really going this well? And it's, it's really, you know, so yeah, in, in terms of the real world, that's success, you know, but there's, there's always frustrating moments. The morning I get up, I don't feel like getting out of bed. You know, it's like it, all that, all that happens. And yet there's some gigs I'd like to have that I, I don't have now, but I don't, I don't feel that anymore like I'm not getting rewarded for the work I've put in. And I know if I want to get better at stuff, I, I need to work at this and I work at that. I, honestly, my most joyous feeling is when it's about nine o'clock in the morning and I'm already up and I'm ready to work and I've got nothing impending. Like I, maybe I don't have to, I don't have a gig until that night or I have nothing. I mean, that hardly ever happens, but like nothing scheduled. I can just practice. I can do long tones on flute for 45 minutes and not worry about it and then transcribe and then do some ear training and sit, oh, yeah. sit at the drums and then write some music and then, you know, practice, you know, I just, oh, to me, that's just like, that's like being a kid in a candy store. Just like with, yeah. you know, just like being able to do just, that's, that's probably the most joyful I feel. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. That's definitely, sure. yeah, that's beautiful. Definitely. And, um, you know, uh, I just want to wrap it up and say that, uh, you know, all the stories you said are very inspirational. Uh, they've been very inspirational to me as a musician uh, growing up in the New Jersey area myself. And I could probably say the same for, you know, a lot of musicians growing mm -hmm. up here. So thank you for your contributions. Uh, thank you for being such a leader in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you know, we have a lot of stuff that we could talk about all day yes for sure. every day and uh you know if you come to the jam session you'll, you'll hear you know every week it's like a different topic discussion you yeah. know and um but we'll definitely have you back in the future uh we are thinking I, i'm I, I do need to be the first repeat <laughs> since i couldn't be okay, the first so interview I, mike I, lee will be number one on our podcast uh <laughs> there we go yeah so uh i want yeah. that in writing <laughs> uh we'll, we'll see and um yeah, no, it's, it's been really uh, a pleasure to have you here. So thank you for your time. It's been you my know. pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, Peter. yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, Corona fist bump here. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, cool. Cool. Nice. They want to become this, like, this grunt little... <laughs> Don't worry about that. <laughs> but uh, no kitty, I know they, they, they love me. They sense they, they're like, who's the allergic person? Let me go sit in his lab. Yeah. Right.